How do you write a screenplay in a week? So I stick to the three pages a day rule. And then if the story just starts flowing, then it'll start flowing on its own and I kind of let that take its place. And then when I start feeling fatigued, I stop. Because when you're fatigued, you're not going to do yourself justice. So if you think about a week, 90 pages, 15, 20 pages, you can knock that out if you're in a flow. You have to just keep doing it every day. Just do it. When you find those pockets, what I would do is I'd work, work, work. When I'd have a breathing room, because no one's working eight hours straight nonstop unless you're like doing road work or something. For the most part, you have your little break bubbles. And what I would do during my break bubbles is I would shift and I would write. So I'd write like a page or two and then I'd go back to work and then I'd write another page or two and go back to work. So I would be consistently outputting because the story, like as I'm working on this thing and I'm doing this, the story's in my head. So when I'm working on IT, I'm thinking about the story like, okay, this character can go here. Okay, boom. Then I'll go here and I write. So it's just about utilizing those pockets of free time to write. And it, if, again, if you stick to the three pages a day, 30 days, you have a full feature film. But if you did six, now you got it in 15. If you did nine, you have it in pretty much about seven days. And you said that the story, once you get started, pretty much writes itself. Have you ever had it where the story is not writing itself and you know, okay, this isn't going anywhere? No, um, because I'm not concerned with making it like someone else's story. I'm not concerned with, and now we're all going to pull from what we're influenced by, our favorite movies. Like you're going to, you're going to have similar stories. But when I write, I like the bad guy winning sometimes. I like, you know, things happening that you just don't see coming. So when I write, there's the only structure, really, there's only one thing that I follow as my guide. And mind you, I'm not a master writer. There's, this, is, this is not a master class. But the one thing I follow is what's making these characters move forward? What's making these characters move forward? And what I notice is a lot of my films, they all take place within two days. So as an indie filmmaker, it's a lot easier to shoot two days because people don't really have to change outfits. Like people can wear the same thing in two days. So you're able to save that. Um, and you're able to tell a blip of a story within that two days. So if you have to do a period piece or something that takes over a year or two years or you don't know how many days, then there's a lot of things that you add as far as complexity. So I kind of steer away from that and I do sh like stories that are within a small space. And the reason why I don't get hung up on something is because I kind of just let it go. And whatever happens is whatever happens. Um, if it's received well, it's received well. If it's not, it's not. But what you do know when you watch it is, huh, that's a unique take on it. That's interesting. That's not what I would, like, let's say if you're a writer watching it, that's not what I would, I was taught to write because there should be more back and forth conflict. Like if I watch a movie and you're able to take somebody out, it drives me crazy when like, let's say you beat up the bat, like Michael Myers, you beat him up and you get in the car and then you drive off, like run him over <laughs> 10 times, like run him over and then like make sure he's good and then drive off. Uh, in my stories, it's very like kind of like linear. It's like, okay, we're going to get from point A to point D and we're going to go here. And what is, what's allowing these characters to go here? And that's just the process that I use. And uh, for me, it's, it's been working because I've been able to get out stories. Now, whether they're the best or they're not, the only thing that I ever try to do and this is from an acting standpoint, uh, writing standpoint, filmmaking, is I just try to make things that are entertaining. I don't care about winning awards. I don't care about being the best actor. Can I get you entertained? Can I get you to laugh once? Can I get you to be like, oh, that was cool. Oh, I like that. Oh, no, get that again. If I can get you to do that once within that film, I did my job. Outside of that, I, I don't chase perfection because I don't think perfection is real. You can have masterpieces, absolutely. But there's beauty in the imperfections. So I think it's more important to get out that vision than to wait for everything to be perfect or for you to create perfection. Because what happens 
if you're able to create perfection for 90%, but you're not able to finish 100% and you have something that's been sitting there for 10, 15 years, and now you've gotten into a point in your life where you're in this rhythm, you're in this routine, and you weren't able to finish your perfection. I think it's better to get it out and get it done and get better and get better and, and, and get master your craft and get better and kind of learn from the mistakes that you make, evolve, enhance, influence, inspire other people. And with that, you're able to create more. And I think it's more important to have 20 shots at this dream that we're all pursuing than to have one shot. And I like my odds better at 20 shots. How do you organize scenes and structure a screenplay? Okay, so 90 pages. I don't really go by arcs. So if you go back to, okay, what's driving them forward? You have this, this mission, right? Whatever it is that drives them forward. As an ind uh, me writing it as an indie filmmaker, I know that I can't go super crazy because I have to be able to capture it. So I can't do cars exploding, drifting off of a bridge into a helicopter. Like I can't do that. Not to say that I can't, but I'm limited at that moment in time and space to accomplish that. So when I write, I write what's feasible. I write 90 pages. I don't write 120, 130, then have to chop away. It's 90 pages. I write what I know I can film and what I'm going to film. Um, and then I write locations that I, I'm pretty confident that I can procure. And then once that's done, I break the scenes down by location. So if I have 15 locations in the film, then each location is associated with a scene number. So then now when I go to that location, I know we're doing scenes 7, 29, and 3. And then the actors all know, okay, we're doing 7, 29, and 3 because that's what's associated with this location. So when you break down scenes and scripts this way by locations and the scenes associated with those uh, locations and you take away the magic allure of it and you just put in the work because in reality, all we're doing is lighting, audio, and we're pushing record. That's it. You take away the thought of I need 20 crew members. I need a PA. I need a, I need this. I need that. Take all that away and just think about what is the work. The work is to capture your story in front of the lens to the best of your ability at that time. So once you're able to do that and you're able to break it down into these sections, now you know, okay, I have 15 locations. I have 15 shoot days. So let's plan around these 15 shoot days. We have three scenes, six scenes, two scenes. I have four hours, two hours, three hours. Now you created a plan on how to shoot your film. Now those are just consistent small steps that you do nonstop. Then when you get to that last location and you shoot those scenes, you're now done and you're working on the post-production on editing, color grading, sound design, voices, and you're doing all of that. But as far as shooting, because you created a plan on how you were going to do it and you were consistent about it, you did it. And that's kind of how I break down films. I break down films by scenes and locations and I tie them together. So then when I get a location, if I have to do 10 scenes in three hours, I know we have to fly. There's no, there's no double take, triple take, we gotta fly. But if I have one scene for one location, I can get 100 shots and take my time with it. So you'll have some scenes that turn out better than others because you had more time with it. But it's better to have a completed film and continue to get better than to just try and get that perfect shot. And then now instead of a 16, 15 shoot day, you have a 50, 60 shoot day that took three or four years because you didn't plan. How did you create the character of Ace in Four Amigos? So Ace, Four Amigos uh, pulls a lot of influence from Fast and the Furious. Um, I think any film with cars pulls from Fast and the Furious, but Ace is, is almost like Paul Walker's character, but Asian. Um, I just wrote what I wanted to see on screen and I pulled from the things that I love. 
one of the main things that I've loved since I was a teenager is cars and the car culture and the car community. And they are so embraceive of each other, right? It doesn't matter if you have a $1,500 Honda Civic that you built up in your garage or you have a $80,000 CA Corvette. It just doesn't matter. Like there's love for cars, which turns into love for people. So with Ace's character, I knew, okay, what could I do to move the story forward? What can I shoot that's feasible from where I am currently at in life? I said, okay, his mom is sick and he has to rob somebody. How can I incorporate cars without making it, you know, have cheesy car dialogue and stuff? And my dialogue is very simple because it's really, my, my films are more, I think, story driven and the characters are kind of just develop compared to character driven and then the story develops. So I'm more interested in the story of how did they get from point A to point D, right? How did they get there? And with Ace, I was like, okay, how can I, how can I make him get to where he's trying to get to and incorporate cars. That was the main thing because I had access to these cars, these amazing cars. And I knew that I had a higher level of success with the niche film, right? So like if I was going to make a, a film about cars, I know there's an audience, a multi-billion dollar audience attached to that. And I, I own all the Fast and the Furious Blu-rays. I watch like all of them yearly. I'll go and just do a marathon run because I just love cars and I love car films and car culture. So by me, uh, not me, by us creating a tuner film, we automatically had that niche audience because I know they're gonna wanna see the NSX, the supercharged BRZ, these cars. I know they're gonna wanna see it. So by having that niche audience, we have a greater level and greater chance of success. So then it was just about incorporating my character into that space. How can I get him into a, a action-esque film? How can I give him the biggest chance to succeed? And when I write these scripts and I write these stories, I write myself in mind for parts that I wanna see someone like myself play. Um, so by having that connection to his mom, anybody can relate because anybody would do anything to help save their mom or their dad. So that already connects to the human portion of, of who we are. Then to go rob the bad guy, I painted the bad guy as a real bad guy. So when things happen throughout the story, when things happen at the end, you were like, yeah, he was so nasty. I'm so glad they got him. And then for the good guys to win, even though I do like the bad guys winning, in this particular story, it was about the good guys winning and then setting up the sequel. Um, there's a lot of scenes where cars are in the film way longer than a normal film would have had them. Because I knew car guys just wanna see those shots, so I left them in there. But it was really about just kind of like a hero's journey um, about a guy that is into car culture that saves his mom. 